We'll talk about Liechtenstein, the gold standard in open groin hernia repair. And uh, as, as Agneta said, I, I uh, run the Liechtenstein Amid Hernia Clinic at UCLA. Um, and the main reason to really be here is such a great meeting, you know, of uh, all of these friends. And, and Victor and, and Merche put on such a great uh, program for you guys. But, it, but really, it's a, it's a small meeting. Please interact with everybody. We're all friends here. Uh, so, why is inguinal hernia so important? It's because it's such a high volume surgery. You know, 20 million worldwide in the United States, it's 800,000. And when we talk about recurrence in the mesh era, uh, we, we talk about recurrence rates about 2%. So we're doing pretty well from recurrence. And when we talk about hernia, then we really need to talk about pain. We need to talk about quality of life. That if a patient comes to you and they have a hernia, you want them to be better from the hernia, not just that they don't have the bulge, but they don't have pain from it. So when we talk about inguinal hernia repairs, there's over 40 different types of inguinal hernia repairs. And when we say, what should we all know so we can take care of all of our patients. We should all learn a good tissue repair. We should all learn to do a shoulder ice repair. We should all learn to do a, a mid-modified Liechtenstein. We'll talk about that today when we talk about Liechtenstein. The problem is everybody does a Liechtenstein a little bit differently, and when you deviate from that, then it doesn't have the same necessary outcomes as, as you would say that, oh, I did a Liechtenstein. It's just, but did you do all the same steps that would make the outcomes uh, ideal. A stopa repair, be that a tip or a trep, is, a, is the open uh, operation of, of uh, putting a preperitoneal mesh that would be ideal. And then a tep and a tap, done robotically, laparoscopically, however you want to get to it, accomplishes really kind of the, the nice operation of covering all defects. Um, so when we talk about patient selection, who should have a Liechtenstein? Uh, who should we start there? So prior lower, or lower abdominal or pelvic surgery, we can do a prostatectomy, we can do a colectomy, and do a laparoscopic or a robotic operation, but the question becomes, after about an hour in, when you're de dealing with scar, why didn't I just do a Liechtenstein, or why didn't I just do a shoulder? So posterior recurrence without pain, just do a Liechtenstein. Uh, if you think that someone has extensive visceral adhesions, uh, poor cardiac or pulmonary function. I did a guy just before I came here, 92 years old, bad ejection fraction was 20, but very terrible symptomatic hernia. We just do it awake, local anesthesia, and he talks during the whole time, jumps off the table, and he's fine. So it really is a nice operation. Uh, if we think about active anticoagulation, you just, it's a less, less of a risk for bleeding. Uh, you can do it without general anesthesia, as we talked about, uh, resource limiting settings. You know, I run a charity, we go to Haiti, we go to Paraguay, and you can go in a back room uh, with a you know, clean OR and, and just you don't need much, and you can do this operation anywhere in the world. Uh, and preference. Sometimes patients want, want to have this. My chairman of surgery, he just you know, retired and, uh, and he came to me and you know, he said, well, what, what kind of surgery should I have? And he wants to have a Liechtenstein. Why? Because he has a little bit of dementia now, wants to avoid the anesthesia. So a lot of times people have a preference of what they want. But Liechtenstein, we talk about it being the gold standard, not because it's the best operation for everybody. Actually, I do a Liechtenstein probably only 30% of the time at the Liechtenstein Institute. Um, but it's the gold standard because it's what we should compare everything to. It has the most data on it and the longest experience of a you know, 40-year operation. So this is our goal, that we want to have recurrence rates and chronic pain rates of less than half a percent. And when we talk about the Liechtenstein, you say this is the original Liechtenstein on this side. Do you have a pointer by any Thank you. So the original Liechtenstein on this side has a, um, this is smaller mesh. And you can see that Parva's enlarged the size of the mesh. It didn't overlap the tubercle. And it's a continuous suture. You see there's no mention of where the nerves run. And so Parva's changed that technique to widen the mesh, to use interrupted, to point out the nerves, because that's what made the quality better. And so he changed the technique after 3,000 patients. He did 3,000 cases, and for four recurrences, he changed the whole technique. Because he said that these four recurrences all happened in the same place, at the, uh, at the overlap interface of the tubercle, and medially, from a direct recurrence, and also with the nerves. And so he changed that technique to what we call the amid modified Liechtenstein repair. So instead of 5 by 10 mesh, 7 by 15 goes over the tubercle, absorbable suture on the medial side, not, uh, not running but interrupted so that we can protect the nerves. And that's what we'll talk about with the steps. So when we talk about the anatomy, you have such great lectures this morning from Johan and David, and if you can even just watch those lectures once, it just helps you to be a better surgeon because you think about, oh yeah, this anatomy is relevant. But when we think about the nerves, it's important in every case because it will improve our outcomes, especially with the Liechtenstein, where the risk comes from the fact that the mesh and the nerves live in the same plane. As a 
opposed to in laparoscopy, the nerves just aren't there. The iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal just are not even there. So when we talk about a Lichtenstein or any open repair, shoulder ice as well, you have to think about these nerves each time, the genital, the iliohypogastric, the ilioinguinal. And if you do, your rates of pain can drop to less than 1% if you just think about the nerves and deal with them as they should be. But the problem is that the nerves you know, are not always predictable. So here's the ilioinguinal, the one you find first as you open the canal. But this is an example of an ilioinguinal with nine branches. And so I'm doing this operation with the resident, and this is just, I always tell them, you know, this nerve we have to remove, otherwise it's going to cause trouble. But the, the human body, anatomy is just, especially in the inguinal canal, it's just like a gallbladder. There's, it's only trying to screw you. That's all it's trying to do. So what you want to do is you want to say, okay, how can I make sure that I don't have a problem when the anatomy is against me? Iliohypogastric nerve we find at the conjoined tendon where it exits as it pierces the internal it has to exit the external oblique and so but the problem is sometimes you don't see it so here you see 10 to 15 percent of the time you will not see the iliohypogastric nerve in the in the inguinal canal but if you pull it has to exit and what happens is it can run a sub aponeurotic course when we do our neurectomies and so you want to just think about the course of that so if I run a continuous suture here I'm going to injure that nerve. So that's why we do interrupted suture here. I tell the residents to absorbable, interrupted, the one place in the world you want them to tie an air knot. Loose knot, because it just won't trap the nerve. The genital nerve we find with the uh, external spermatic vein, within the cremasteric bundle. You don't have to skeletonize it. You, don't have, you just have to know where it is. And so the genital nerve should just be protected in its investing in the cremastic investing fascia. Here's the, uh, you look for the blue line, you find the white line, and that's the genital nerve. So you want to preserve this investing fascia, that the nerves are covered as they penetrate, and they're covered with a little investing fascia. What you don't want to do is you don't want to move them. And so if you move them, you know, I was taught this as an intern by, by many surgeons, they say move the nerve out of the way. But if you do that, the nerve is naked. I think that this made less of a difference in the Bassini era and in the Shouldice era because you didn't put mesh. But if you now move this nerve and then you put a piece of mesh in the same, con uh, same compartment, you cause, you cause more difficulty uh, with regards to scarring and nerve irritation. This is also people use their finger to dissect the cord. We use a little peanut or a kitner to lift it off of the tubercle. But this also will skeletonize, it will uh, break the cremaster and the genital nerve becomes a problem. So when we say, where did people learn this stuff from? Well, they learned it from us, from the first Lichtenstein operation. And you can see that they split the cord in the first operation into two bundles, the same way that you do a shoulder ice repair. Why? Because we didn't know. We didn't know any better at that time in 1980. Uh, but by 1994, Parvis said, you got to preserve the cremaster so the genital and the vas deferens are protected from the mesh. So we try to change our things, change our technique based on what we've learned. So the incision, traditionally about a six centimeter incision, you can make it smaller or bigger as you need to. Uh, I like to draw out the anatomy for the residents, so symphysis, tubercle, inguinal ligament, you can feel the vessels, you'll say direct space, indirect space, and so we make an incision about six centimeters, we infiltrate with local anesthetic, we've learned so much by doing this under local because the patient will tell you, I feel it or I don't feel it. When we find the superficial epigastric vessel, we tie it and then cut it instead of burning through it because if you burn it, patients will say that hurts. They have little nerve fibers that run with it, uh, and so if you tie it, one, it doesn't hurt, and two, is that if you look at hematoma after Lichtenstein, oftentimes this is your culprit. This little guy will bleed. So then you look for a small window to find the external oblique. And before you do all the rest of the dissection and infiltrate with local anesthetic underneath the canal at this point, because then you have where you haven't done a lot of dissection, it doesn't hurt, you inject into the field, you hydro dissect that 10 cc's, 10 milliliters of local anesthetic, and you'll see the whole canal fill with local. But then your nerves are bathed in local and the patient's now comfortable. You open the external oblique in the direction of its fibers. We pick the halfway point of the canal. Uh, so here's the external ring, I picked the halfway point. You can see then your iliohypogast, your ilioinguinal, your iliohypogastric, you separate these two. The key to a good Lichtenstein repair is a Wheatlander. You need a good Wheatlander. I use a seven and a half inch Wheatlander and it gives you perfect exposure of the field rather than having your residents or having your assistant trying to get you better retraction. So again, we talk about iliohypogastric, the genital, white line and blue line, and then here again, white line and blue line. And the key then is that this, when you separate the cord off of the floor, sweep 
along the inguinal ligament and lift it off of the bone, off of the tubercle, not over the direct space. Because if you have a direct hernia, you're going to disrupt the cremaster and internal oblique and uh, transversal fascia that are all fused together. So we do atraumatic isolation of the cord, use a Penrose drain or a vessel loop, pass it underneath. And then the goal is you want to look for your hernias. Do I have a direct hernia? Do I have an indirect hernia? And probably the most important thing to learn is that at Lichtenstein, we should look for a femoral hernia as well. So here, we open the cremaster in the direction of its fibers, then you will not injure the uh, ilioinguinal nerve. You then want to say, how do I know if I have a hernia sac or not? Well, here it's obvious if you have a hernia sac, but if you're looking for a hernia sac, you say, if I find my vas deferens as it exits from the internal ring, if you see the vas and there's no peritoneum over it, there's no indirect hernia sac. Why? Because from laparoscopy we know, and you teach the medical students, that the sac is always anterior medial. We always know that the peritoneum meets the vas deferens and then travels up. So if you see the vas, no sac, no indirect hernia. Now we're going to look for a direct hernia. You look at Hesselbeck's triangle, right? The floor of the canal. You find your inferior epigastric vessels. And if you have your inferior epigastric vessels, this is your direct space. So your direct hernia will be here. So here you can see I can reduce the direct hernia and flatten it out. We open the inguinal floor if there's a direct hernia to look for a femoral hernia. If there's no direct hernia, I can open the sac and feel into the femoral canal. But why? Why should we do this? Well, because we've learned from the, from the Swedish registries that the failure of a Lichtenstein is the femoral hernia much more common in women, which is if I have a female patient, I would tell them your best operation is to do a uh, laparoscopic or a robotic, a MIS, uh, tap or tap, because it covers the femoral canal. But for, uh, if you do a normal Lichtenstein, you just want to make sure you're not missing it, because when we talk about failures, if it's a femoral hernia, you just would have never seen it. So you open the floor, and you're going to look for, is there a femoral hernia? So here's an example of a femoral hernia. The floor is opened. This is going out to the thigh. That's the inguinal ligament. And here you can see that this uh, is all coming through the femoral canal here. So this is an incarcerated fat-containing femoral hernia. And you can see here um, the floor of the canal. That's all femoral hernia that I reduced. And we can push that back into, uh, into the space. That's a direct space. So uh, we then close the floor of the canal. We do a Marcy suture at the internal ring. And the Marcy suture just closes the aperture of the internal ring. And then I'll just run this along the floor, just closing transversalis fascia and internal oblique without the inguinal ligament. So there's no tension. You're just making a nice flat landing zone for the mesh to, to be placed here. So the floor is closed, the mesh will sit flat here. Uh, it prevents what's called a pseudo recurrence, where the, we have a big transversalis indirect, uh, direct sac underneath the mesh. This is the shape of the mesh. Parv has described it as the heel of a foot. 7 by 15 centimeters. The key is that this portion wants to overlap over the tubercle. And so when we say what kind of mesh should we use, honestly you can use any of the macroporous modern meshes. That we can use uh, lighter weight meshes cause less foreign body sensation, just needs to have it needs to be stronger than 16 newtons per centimeter square. So every mesh that you use is probably going to be fine in this day and age, but you want a, a macroporous mesh. And the lighter weight, uh, honestly patients feel it less. So laterally permanent suture, uh, to the level of the internal ring. This is where I tell people to stop. You want to start over the tubercle. Here's Parva's suturing in his original video. This is one and a half to two centimeters of overlap over the tubercle. And then he's going to just run this along. You can see he'll run it along the lateral aspect to end over here at this level. Proline suture permanent. Can you use a PDS? You can. You can. But we just do it the same way every time with a non-absorbable suture because uh, there's no interface here. So you want to have a permanent suture. The lateral mesh fixation ends at this level at the internal ring. We then split the tails, so we end here. Split the tails, cut to the halfway point of the cord. And here then we can see that that splits across, splitting the mesh. Uh, and then the upper tail, the medial side, absorbable suture to avoid the nerve. Here as you can see, absorbable suture, here's the nerve. I'm gonna avoid that. Then we cross upper tail over lower tail. To make the, this is somebody ran a continuous suture. They trapped the iliohepigastric nerve right here. You can see that that's a Lichtenstein with old technique. Creates the mesh internal ring. We save about four centimeters of cephalate extension of the mesh. Why? Because we always talk about the concept of the low lying spagellion. And here, just this week, I had this case that this guy had a low lying spagellion. So here you can see that's a spagellion hernia. This is the direct space here. Here's direct space. And then you can see when I look up here, 
This is a low-lying spaghetti, and I tucked a little Raytech into here. And so what we'll do is we, uh, Carnard Ballister last night, while we were there, he's all, what do I do with this? He's a low-lying spaghetti, and here's the indirect, this, and so he's, and he's all, oh, should I close it or not close it? And I just say, just close it with small stitches, and then that tail covers the floor there. Okay, so that's the, this is the tails tucking to cover the low-lying spaghetti. So, so I'm gonna stop this and then I'll. <laughs> so we close the floor here, external oblique. The femoral modification, if you have a femoral hernia, we can make a little triangular extension here and that will cover the femoral canal. So you can see here we'll sew it to Cooper's ligament and that will cover the femoral canal here. And so this is just, we parachute that down and then just do the rest of the Liechtenstein as normal. Okay, so that's, that's the femoral modification, if you happen to find the femoral hernia. So what about cutting the nerves, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal? Uh, we don't recommend cutting them prophylactically. But if you had that nerve like I showed you with nine branches or it's in the way, you can do a pragmatic neurectomy. And what you do is you'll cut the nerve, we tie it, and then what we'll do is we'll tie that and leave the tails, we'll take the tail and bury the nerve trunk stump into the muscle. And that's called proximal intramuscular re, uh, reimplantation, the same thing that we do for a triple neurectomy. And that will take that nerve and give it something to do. So that, that's how you do a neurectomy. What does the data show us for this? We know that if you look at the data, we know that the recommendations, we say that we recommend endoscopic techniques. Why? Because a little less pain, a uh, little bit um, faster return to function, right? So, uh, if, but if you look at the actual data, it's not that, you know, it's not that dramatic that it actually, the source data favored Liechtenstein until you took out uh, one of the surgeons who had more complications than the rest. So we say that Liechtenstein and LAP are both good techniques. We should all be able to learn it. And when you look at the German data, after 60,000 patients, you know, they say TEP and TAP have advantages. But when you look at the differences, 3.8 versus 3.3, 1.2 versus 0.9, honestly, they're all good techniques if you just do a good job. So uh, we talked about that. So open Liechtenstein is the gold standard for which we can compare local anesthesia. Think about your nerves, look for femoral hernia, size the mesh appropriately. And sometimes as we talked about, Liechtenstein is your best MIS option. So this is Parvin Zamid who was my mentor in Liechtenstein and uh, thank you for allowing me to be here and run over time. <laughs>